This event, as you know, is being co-hosted by National Skill Development Corporation, the ASRA Foundation, Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship, and the Nudge Center for Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. We welcome you all for an exciting series of sessions today. To kick things off for the day, our first panel uh, is on a topic which is about platforms to connect and support opportunities and workforce in the skilling economy. The panel aims to discuss the impact of demand and supply aggregation in the skilling ecosystem and the opportunities and challenges therein. Let me introduce our panelists to you. Our first panelist is Ankit Chug, Vice President, Meet Medha. Ankit is charged with building an online platform, meetworks.in, that aims to improve the employment experience for youth. The platform is designed to make the job market more inclusive and transparent for youth. In his previous assignment, Ankit launched a career exploration platform, Escape Velocity, in 2015, which impacted more than 15,000 students in vocational education programs in India. Welcome, Ankit. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Our next panelist is Rituparna Chakrabarti, who is the co-founder and EVP Team Lease Services. Rituparna co-founded Team Lease in 2003 and has been instrumental in establishing it as one of the best workers' job sites that deals with entry-level and blue-collar jobs in the country. She is also the founder, trustee, and president of the Indian Staffing Federation. Rituparna has been with Team Lease since inception. She's responsible for staffing and also drives their net app, which is the National Employability Through Apprenticeship Program Initiative. Welcome, Rituparna. Our next panelist is Madhav, who is the founder for Wahan. Madhav started off as an immigration rights activist in the US, and now he runs Wahan, a mobile education platform for low-income populations. He started this platform to make education more accessible and effective for underprivileged communities. He's also helping businesses hire at scale using basic messaging apps like WhatsApp. Madhav, happy to have you here. Thank you, Sarah. Finally, Finally, introducing our moderator, Praveen Agarwal, who is the co-founder and CEO of Better Place. Praveen is an industry veteran, a global tech leader and entrepreneur. He started Better Place, a digital platform aimed at the informal and semi-formal workforce of India. It helps drivers, maids, housekeeping staff, security guards, and delivery boys, among others, to get skilled, employed, and become part of financial inclusion. Over to you, Praveen, for the panel, and look forward to an insightful discussion from all of you. Thank you, Saurabh. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful session. As somebody said, show must go on. And here we are in a digital world. Very exciting. Never thought that this could ever happen. Uh, everybody is talking about migratory workforce, jobless problems, people moving back. Uh, how can we help them? What are the things that should be done? And today we would like to spend time together with uh, all the experts from the industry on how a technology platform could help uh, the current situation and perhaps as a long-term option for all of us to capture to the huge demand of uh, the, the migratory workforce or the blue collar workers in the country. One of the questions that keeps coming back to our mind is that, is there a need of a supply demand kind of uh, platform? Uh, do we have clarity on the demand in the industry? Uh, on how many people are required, where are they required, why they are required, or is there a supply problem where we don't know where the people are, is there an access problem? Let me ask Madhav, what do you think Madhav, in terms of is there a need of uh, such a technology platform? And if there is one, how do you see that? Sure, Praveen, thank you, happy to answer that. Um, so I definitely think uh, there is a need for such a platform, uh, Praveen. What we found after working with thousands of job seekers, as well as employers, uh, is that it's a two-sided problem. From the perspective of job seekers, uh, there's a very strong information gap or lack of awareness issue. 
uh, where the awareness about jobs that are available in the market is very, very limited. And uh, we found that it's an echo chamber of sorts. Uh, communities end up doing the same jobs for years, even generations. You know, you'll find uh, if you talk to an Uber driver, they'll, they'll tell you that uh, their uh, father and their grandfather perhaps were drivers as well. And that's why they're in that profession. So entire communities end up doing the same profession because that's all they know. And uh, they're very heavily reliant on their personal networks to discover jobs today. Uh, and that's an information gap problem that we're looking to solve because we bring people uh, jobs over WhatsApp. And then on the other hand, from the employer standpoint, um, recruitment is very fragmented uh, and uh, unscalable. Most employers work with hundreds of, rec hundreds of recruitment agencies all over the country, uh, and the process becomes very inefficient and hard to scale and expensive for them to manage. And so that's where a lot of efficiencies can be brought in through technology platforms like ours as well. Thanks, Madhav. I think that's very interesting, uh, especially that that there is there is a lot of inefficiency and people have been doing the same thing and this leads me to uh, Ritu uh, you have been working with uh, thousands of customers as well as managing lakhs of people and this has been there for now uh, uh, 15 plus years right so how do you see Ritu I mean do you really see that uh, business could expand if there is a technology platform the problems could be solved or you think that this is more of a talk rather than the reality right now answer very briefly yes uh, very emphatic yes but I think before I uh, explain why I believe in it I think it's important to understand what are the three people supply chain challenges today I think matching definitely and when I say matching I'm talking about connecting people to demand so for us uh, at Teamly's we've hired about 1.7 million people since inception but we've managed to only hire five percent of the kids who've ever reached out to us so I guess um, somewhere we feel that there is a situation of acute information asymmetry. I think Madhav touched upon it briefly. I think so in a country like India, whatever we do, we have to do it at scale. And that is the reason I think we went ahead and invested uh, and positioned teamlease.com as India's uh, uh, only vernacular language matching portal because uh, an organization of our size to being able to do this through offline channels uh, in volumes at, at the end of the day either it's going to compromise on the efficacy of matching or it's going to compromise in the speed at which i'm able to do matching uh, and uh, a third i think finally we would not be able to tap into all the relevant profiles across the country and i think that's why we felt that technology is a solution and that's the reason i feel that uh, my answer is such an emphatic yes. However, it doesn't stop by just solving uh, the matching problem because it is. it leads me to the other two challenges. Repair is an issue in India. When I say repair, I mean, I am not using it in a, in a inhuman or a uh, derogatory sense. But when I say repair, I'm talking about repairing people for demand, which essentially means the last mile intervention that kids today need. So incidentally, 58% of our graduates today earn less than the skill minimum wages. So there is a, um, in any case, we have an underemployment situation which exists. So is there again, a technology, can technology be brought in to be able to help uh, do repair better? And that would be, um, that would aid matching better. So it's not just doing matching, if I do not have the right kind of people to enable match, it's not going to happen. And again, is there a way of doing it at scale? And finally, preparing people. Essentially, this is, of course, the longest haul of the problem. I mean, uh, we did certain interventions at Teamly's by coming out with uh, training institutes to impart. We came out with video-based training much before COVID happened. But I guess um, all of that seemed like putting lipstick on a pig because... You can't teach kids in three months what they've not learned in 12 months of education. And that's why as an organization, we started focusing on preparing people for demand, which means can we actually vocationalize our education earlier on? Um, and I think we believe that at some point, India has to liberate itself. And again, I actually feel COVID is a blessing in disguise for us when it comes to online education and, and the real kind of education. Um, and at some point, if we are able to 
legitimize online education, MOOCs education, and combine it with a series of on-the-job programs, we might have a holistic technology-aided solution to the three challenges that we see around us in the people supply chain. So that's, that's how I would look at it. Very interesting. I think uh, one of the things that everybody talks about is not only that there is a matching platform, but they must be employable, right? There has to be uh, skills. And Ankit, you have uh, worked with uh, Meda, you are working with Neat right now. Uh, how do you see uh, the gap between supply and demand might be that supply is available, but it's not employable. So what kind of technology that we can bring in from a uh, platform perspective? And what is your experience from Meda to Meet in terms of creating that, those uh, upskilling and finding the right uh, match from a, a skills perspective as well? Sure. So I think both uh, Rituparna and Madhav made great points. Um, so I first want to expand on the points they made about uh, you know, matching being the problem. Um, so I think when it comes to matching, I, uh, technology is going to play a very critical role um, you know, when it, uh, on, three, on three different aspects. I think the first aspect is that you know, the recruitment and the matching is going to get very hyper-local. Um, I think, uh, I mean, that was pretty evident in um, you know, even our prime minister's speech, vocal for local, I mean, that was his motto. Right. So I think the matching is going to get very hyper local. So I think from that point of view, um, you know, demand is going to surge um, um, first or demand is going to first recover. Um, you know, demand for, jo demand for job seekers is first going to recover in smaller town cities. Right. Um, so I think that that is an interest. I mean, that is a um, place where technology can play a role. I mean, using location, I, can, I mean, can we give access to, um, you know, job seekers about op uh, opportunities in their area using their, you know, current location and can um, employers see, um, you know, people near their location, people who are interested to work in their companies and, um, you know, a kind of a discovery platform and, um, you know, places where they can see, okay, which people are actually interested to work with them, right? So that's one. Um, and the second point is, I think, uh, with such, you know, mass movement of people from one region to another, um, I mean, uh, migrants have been moving from, um, you know, bigger cities to smaller cities and also um, to rural areas, right? So I think uh, there's a need for more transparency, I think, I would say, uh, from, the, from both the employers and job, seeker, job seekers' perspective. Um, from the job seekers' perspective, what that means is that, um, you know, that people will want to know that people will want to know about companies, about the work environment, whether um, in the times of COVID, how did they treat their employees? Right. What are the kind of hygiene practices they are following? Right. So I think transparency um, from the point of view of employers is going to play a big role. Um, and similarly, from the point of view of employers, uh, from, you know, from the point of view of employers, um, they will want to see, um, um, you know, they, they will want to have more standardized metrics for, you know, comparing people that are applying to their companies. So I think the role of certifications there might go up. So, for example, um, you, um, the role of certifications of uh, I mean, the role of NSQF certifications, right? So more and more employers are going to seek, um, you know, ways to kind of figure out where, where does a, you know, uh, potential employee stand for me. Um, and the third part is, I think, uh, um, where technology can play a role is in delivering full stack solutions. So what I mean by that is that um, even for employers, for example, especially smaller employers, MSMEs, um, I mean, they need, I mean, not just recruitment, but they need access to all kinds of um, solutions because, um, I mean, they have a lot of functions um, merged into one. So what I mean by that is they need um, solutions for attendance. They need solutions for, um, you know, um, other kinds of onboarding activities, uh, which, you, which you traditionally don't find on matching platforms. But I think uh, these matching platforms kind of need to expand their scope to becoming full stack solutions, right? Um, and, uh, and next, I think talking about the, you know, um, employability point of view, I think um, for all roles, uh, the general employability skills are going to remain, um, you know, important. I mean, they're, uh, they're always going to remain evergreen. Um, so skills like um, uh, listening, skills like speaking, skills, um, you know, collaboration, uh, thinking. So all of these skills are actually going to, um, you know, remain always relevant. And I think um, online education can definitely play a role in even catalyzing um, demand for these skills and also delivery of these skills. Um, so that's, that's my point. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important point, especially on the uh, local jobs. I will come back to that point. Uh, but before I get into that, one of the things that uh, we are hearing uh, every day uh, and all across is, is migratory workforce going back, right? Uh, and they are losing jobs either where they're 
running because of fear or because of jobless uh, problems or whatsoever. Uh, Madhu, you did work with Airtel, started reaching out to the people. Uh, in your experience, how do we uh, encourage people perhaps to stay back into the job or if they are going back, how do we collect their data and help them find a local job like Ankit spoke about? So in your view, how technology can help uh, perhaps uh, in, in uh, addressing the problem, which is definitely going to be there and perhaps already there today? Ty, that's a very pertinent uh, question, Praveen, and a very, very hard problem to solve, I believe. Uh, I, in fact, spoke with a few laborers who were working at a construction site uh, on the road where I live in Bangalore. And it was very evident that uh, there was just a very high degree of fear. Uh, you know, they were being completely irrational. I told them that they'll take the infection back to their, they were traveling from uh, Bangalore to Gwalior in a truck over four days, and they were paying 2000 rupees a head to do that. And I told them that you guys are going to take uh, the infection back with you to your village and people will get infected. And they said, kuch nahi hoga. you know, they were just being irrational and uh, just completely acting out of fear. And I believe, uh, you know, that any sort of intervention, especially a technology intervention might be able to help us to some degree, but there's a more fundamental issue here that would be very hard to solve, uh, right? With a heightened sense of fear uh, being prevalent. That said, uh, like you mentioned, we have done some work with Airtel. In fact, we estimate that about 40% of migrant workers from cities like Delhi and Bangalore have left uh, the cities and gone back to their uh, hometowns, uh, at least 40%. That's probably a, a lower or uh, more conservative estimate. Uh, getting them back into uh, cities or getting them to stay is, uh, I think, a, a highly uphill task. What we have tried to do, at least, is match them with uh, more essential services, so food and shelter services that are being run by NGOs or by the government. So, for example, the Delhi government had converted 500 uh, government schools into food and shelter uh, providing uh, locations. So we helped match people with those again on WhatsApp itself, the easiest platform. And we saw some really good engagement on that, uh, continue to see that as well. So we're trying to help uh, in this regard, but I do feel that it's a very hard problem to solve. Um, and and I, I see this not just in sort of the blue collar segment, right? This is happening all across the board. Uh, even people from the middle class, upper middle class, everybody's feeling scared. Everybody's trying to flee. Um, and uh, go back to their uh, homes. Um, and I don't think technology can solve this on its own. Um, I think the entire ecosystem and the community will need to come out and uh, potentially the government will need to, to make greater provisions to help people and uh, support them uh, so that they can stay back. Mm -hmm. I think what's, what's very important, as you rightly said, is that when people go back, there might be problems that they carry, but they also have uh, certain problems of... Uh, staying back uh, without earning and so on. So their government has to do a lot of things. But uh, Ritu, in your experience, you since you work with uh, lakhs of people and most of the workers might be migratory workforce uh, and, and the demand typically is uh, skewed in metros, right? Tier one cities perhaps. Do you see a need right now in creating a local demand uh, like Ankit was talking about? And do you also see that uh, uh, there are new areas that perhaps or new skills that we have to look at while creating those uh, uh, local demands. Right. So I think uh, something that I've learned from the government of Kerala, which I feel all of us should learn, is that let's start calling them guest workers rather than migrant workers. So there are three kinds of guest workers that currently are there in every city uh, or state. One, of course, are the category of the mind workers, the elite mind workers who are coming down. For example, Bangalore is filled with a lot of these people, right? We know them, they're coming from Bombay, they're coming from Delhi. Then there are two categories in the, what I call the hand workers, right? These are uh, ones who are using their physical abilities mostly to uh, carry out their work. And in that, there are also two kinds. One is the ones who are the formal guest workers, which means they're part of the formal workforce. And then there are those who are completely in the informal workforce. So I'm a little worried because a lot of the current narrative is trying to address all the three people's challenges together. We know that the first category hasn't moved out of the cities much. They don't need to. Uh, I don't think they have any challenge in terms of their jobs, financial abilities, and the awareness level is high. So it leaves us with the other two segments, which is the formal workforce, but 
um, who are guest workers. And I think many sectors, e-commerce, e-grocers, um, food and beverage segments, uh, retailers, have, I at the, used to hire a lot of these people. And on account of the lockdown and on account of some of the incidents also which had happened, uh, these people, um, and I think fear is of course one of them, and the other is community-based decision-making. These guys, they come from certain parts of the country as a, as a group. So there, there are groups coming in from Rajasthan, there are groups coming in from Bihar, there are groups coming in from Purissa, there are groups coming from UP. When one person, or forget, two, three people decide that they want to go back home, they, the way the ecosystem works that everybody wants to go back home because they feel that they feel secure. That's their security, their own community. So we've noticed that people who did have a job, like if I were to talk about some of India's biggest e-grocers today, um, they saw within a day of the lockdown, 50% of their workforce just not showing up to work. And these guys are not like the informal workforce, uh, guest workers. These guys had a job. Uh, and that has happened because of the community pressure, because of uh, fear, and also because of certain treatment that were meted out to them by uh, police officials. All put together, they just felt that it's much more safer for them to leave the city and go out. And it has happened. So I think it's not just a day after the lockdown. It has been happening over a period of week, just before the lockdown as well. And then, of course, the informal workforce, which honestly, um, very difficult to track and difficult to account for. These guys are in construction. These guys are in real estate. These guys are um, in some manufacturing setups. Who are... Um, do, they do not have an employer-employee relationship, actually. They are daily wages. They get to know what work they will be doing early in the morning. They get paid by, in, by the evening. And hence, obviously, there is no ecosystem of security. They are the ones which are most affected, and they are the ones which account for the incident that Madhav just shared. Now, these guys are going back to their respective states, and the, it's, a, it's a fact that North and East of India are the people's supply base for the South and the West of India. So there is a clear prosperity drive. And we have been okay with it. Uh, politicians, public policy makers made peace with that reality, which means it's okay for UP, uh, Bihar, West Bengal maybe, not to have the quality jobs or have the kind of wages that they deserve and hence these guys leave their hometowns to come to the cities where the jobs are. Given that this now these people have moved back to those cities, you have seen the immediate reaction by some of the state governments, right? You saw the brash announcement that came out from UP saying that they're going to exempt. Why? The reason is that they have now understood that with 50,000 or lakhs of workers coming back, they need to create local jobs. Otherwise, it will completely disturb the harmony within the society. Uh, it, what would so many unemployed, jobless people do? I think technology, I agree with Madhav. For that segment, we have to figure out a very different solution from the solutions through technology that we would do for the formal guest workers which have left the city. I feel optimistic about the formal guest workers because at least for us in team leads, we do have their data points. We know where they have gone. We know what, what were their hometowns. And I think those, can met, those details can be used to figure out if there are any job requirements coming up in those cities, can we plug them in? The tricky one would be how do we handle the, the people who are in the informal workforce, the guest workers, and when they go back, how do we mobilize? And yes, we have to work together with the government to figure out the solution to tap into those resources. Uh, saying that they somehow would be able to sustain and survive because Narega has gone up from 182 rupees to 202 rupees may not be sufficient, is my uh, approximation. So, yeah. So, so thanks, Ritu, for that. I think uh, what is perhaps very interesting is, uh, like you said, that people come in community, go back in community, even if there is opportunity, and might be they would look for some opportunity locally. Uh, I'd like to ask Ankit, uh, Ankit, how do you see when people move back as a community in tier two, tier three cities where or uh, the villages that they have, 
Uh, and this is a problem. And one of the questions that I see also is, it's not only about the people who are uh, uh, tenth or below standard uh, workers, right? The people who are grads, but not also finding the job. So do you see a similar pattern um, with respect to the people who are uh, uh, studying or studied from government colleges or perhaps didn't find the right job? Do you see also they going back? And are they also looking for a job which is now around their cities where they have to move back easily to their hometown in case of a lockdown and other situations, they will find it uh, relatively easy? Um, sure. So I think uh, uh, about your question, I think I can answer it, um, that in two parts. Um, the first part is about, you know, uh, people that have more um, education, that have, high, that have higher levels of education, graduates, um, right? So I was re recently reading a statistic where which said that um, with higher education levels, unemployment increases. So, in, so what that means is that there are more graduates and more, um, I mean, more general stream and engineering graduates that are unemployed compared to, um, you know, people that don't have any uh, formal higher education, right? So I think uh, for, um, yeah, for, for, you know, even though, I mean, even though that uh, the number of people that are graduates are, you know, comparatively smaller, but I think it's a problem for them. And um, what I hope happens is that, um, a lot of companies that typically were not really hiring remote workforce, or you know, that not really were not hiring um, uh, gig workers, right? So they are open to hiring um, such um, you know such people in uh, tier two and three cities, right? People that are don't have access to you know knowledge economy jobs um, in tier two and three cities, right? So TCS, for, for example, said that they're going to hire um, that they're going to keep seventy five percent of their workforce um, remote by twenty twenty two or some some year. I don't remember. The exact year, right? So I think um, I hope that um, you know uh, because of the current situation, uh, more and more companies are open to hiring remo uh, people remotely, and um, you know working and are open to them working remotely also. Um, and the second part of it is also that um, you know with more um, work from home opportunities, I think the um, constraints of women traveling to um, the work the workplace, right? So those constraints are also removed. So I really hope that more and more women actually enter into the workforce, especially in the knowledge economy, right? Where there are um, lesser, I mean, where there are lesser constraints to, you know, being physically present at a particular location, um, right? So I think that's probably another positive outcome that is likely to emerge from the current situation. Um, and when it comes to, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, informal sector workers that Ritu Parna was talking about, right? So I, I was recently, uh, listening to uh, the development economist John Ray, right? So he mentioned uh, he was talking about you know that how Jharkhand has remained underdeveloped for such a long time because uh, most of the natural resources are actually mined and um, you know they are shipped off to other places, other industries, right? And the local development hasn't really happened. So now with migrants moving back to um, you know places in Odisha, uh, which and Jharkhand, right, which have abundant natural resources, I really hope that the governments are able to catalyze that. I mean, use the you know uh, flow of people to those areas and catalyze the local development, um, the development of the local economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. So that brings uh, 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 me to uh, Madhav. Uh, Madhav. Uh, uh, so now, one thing is that the people are losing job and they're going back. Uh, do you see that certain things will revive faster in terms of industry and jobs? Uh, so that local jobs or perhaps the jobs uh, in the metros can be created, right? Because if people are going back and there is no job, we can keep talking about it, but we can't do sufficient things for them, right? So do you see that? And do you see that, for example, since you work with a lot of uh, gig economy uh, uh, employees as well as employers, how do you see that equation changing? Would people be more interested in a full-time job now because they are scared of... Uh, uh, fluctuating income, or you see that that will take a surge because employers would like to have uh, that more as their uh, need now, right? So, uh, if you can put those two things together, uh, it would be very interesting to. Uh, sure, sure, Pravi. Yeah, so as uh, Ankit sort of alluded to, right, I think one sector that's going to see a clear surge is remote jobs. And uh, we're seeing that happen. More and more people are willing to take up jobs from home, provided they have the infrastructure. A lot of BPOs have, in fact, invested in uh, buying thousands of uh, laptops, UPSs, and providing internet connections to their workers to transfer them to home. And they're planning on continuing 
with that permanently because ultimately it makes uh, good business sense as well. Um, and so that's one area that's going to see a surge, which will be great because I think it's also going to enable um, a lot of uh, women participation in the labor force, which uh, India has traditionally been uh, uh, you know, way behind on. Um, I think the other segment, as you said, is uh, the gig economy segment, which is clearly seeing a massive surge all across the globe. Um, I think China obviously was uh, sort of the leader on this, but even in the US and now in India, uh, there's a huge demand for delivery services, right? Because people are scared to step out of their homes uh, or go you know, down to the, the local store to pick up uh, essential items. Uh, and so there's a massive surge in the need for workers, uh, for grocery delivery, essentials, et cetera. And so that's another space where some of our customers are seeing the strongest growth in demand uh, that they've ever seen before. Uh, and um, you know, that for us has also been good uh, because we are able to now place people in those jobs. Uh, that said, there still is a lot of fear amongst people. Um, we, uh, we poll every single job seeker that comes to our platform, whether they are looking for a job now or after the lockdown. And accordingly, we match them with a, a job that might be uh, around. Um, and so that is, uh, that is a space, though, that's, uh, that's seeing a lot of growth. Right. Very interesting. A uh, uh, couple of questions which are also coming up, which are very related, is, is what the government should do to create more opportunities for people, right? Uh, when we talk about whether this is uh, creating more skills for people so that they, they can find uh, new jobs, or uh, it's about using a technology platform so government can also bring people into the system, or perhaps it's all about uh, new policies. I believe uh, that we are living in a new normal now, right? And things will change quite, quite a lot. Uh, we had uh, seen these announcements last uh, week uh, about migratory workers, or rather we should call them guest workers, or, uh, or, or policies around uh, labor laws changing. So uh, Ritu, what is your take in terms of what government should do in terms of uh, creating stimulus which they have done for MSME, where it might be there are new jobs coming up. But in principle, what the government should do to ensure there are more opportunities uh, for the people and what kind of laws that should be there, which will help a win-win situation, both for employer and the job seekers. So I think uh, the, the, we, what we need today are lots of jobs. And uh, um, I think the best way to we always believe that the best way to bring back the jobs is to ensure that we relax our labor laws in the country. And I think we, uh, uh, and there is a reason for it. Just to share with you all, today India has about um, 431 uh, acts under central government and state governments under labor laws. There are about 27,000 compliances that have to be done and about uh, 1,333 odd filings. So India's labor law ecosystem is hostile towards uh, enabling job creation. These were acts that were created with a view of job preservation, maybe about 16, 70 years back. And since then, we've paid a huge price for it. And in any case, before our run up to COVID, uh, I think we were all uh, under this realization that something had to be done quickly. And uh, the, maybe one of the steps in that direction was the four labor codes that were being talked about. Um, and of course, they still not come into force. So I think we need all the necessary notification for them to come in force. But they, that was a step towards that. Uh, are, were they perfect? Were they what we needed? No. But I, I honestly think today, and I think today more than ever before, it's become clear to all of us that what India needs is not one prime minister. We need 29 chief ministers to step up. And if every chief minister takes it upon themselves to solve, because now jobs are a local agenda, like we discussed in the previous set of questions. Jobs now are a local agenda. Now we cannot depend on some other state bailing out our state's employee or candidates or youth or whatever, workforce. So every state has to focus on creating jobs. And we believe that um, what has started the, the, the chain of uh, announcements that we have recently seen, while I may not be in agreement with all of them the way they have done it, 
but it was much needed because if we needed a crisis for us to wake up to the realization that we need to change our arcade labor laws we need to simplify them make them comprehensive i'm not somebody who's a who, who believes in no labor laws i believe we need labor laws we need checks and balances um we don't need abolition of labor laws but it it needs to be relevant which encourages employers to create jobs and today we need that more than ever before today if um some of the notification under the disaster management act which came out during the lockdown um while we understand the need for protection of employees but we also have to understand that capital doesn't fund salaries customers do uh, employers of india corporate india have put their two months down payment towards from their side towards fighting corona but expecting that they will be able to continue doing that without any support from the government is asking for too much and that's why we need those relaxation during covid eight state governments during the lockdown sorry came out with minimum wage upward revisions i mean it's thoughtless and hence we have to ensure that we are we stay true to the circumstances because if there are no employers there can't be any employees or jobs and until and unless there are specific measures and this is something that i would actually encourage more and more state governments to come forth and do uh, i've seen yesterday's set of announcements barring the epf announcement there is not much in it from a labor perspective and that announcement let's say if somebody ctc is 17000 rupees will put extra 200 rupees in their hands and that's about it so we need state governments to come out with specific measures which enable and gives employers the confidence that they can go ahead and restart and that they will get the necessary relaxation whether it's in terms of ensuring there are no minimum wages changes for the next 12 months ensuring that they are allowed to work longer than the permitted hours they are allowed to keep employees longer than the permitted hours of course by paying them but they are allowed to doing such stuff are very important right now to ensure that we come out of this uh, state otherwise it's going to be it will push us back by another 60 years uh, mm -hmm. and the move towards for workforce which is absolute and imperative for a country like us will take a back step you will mm -hmm. see informal work go up across the country and that doesn't have good outcomes for us as a country so we all know that so that's my limited point i think we just need to focus on relaxing our labor laws and making them conducive towards creating new jobs and just let me take uh, two questions from uh, uh, the audience uh, one for uh, ankit uh ankit do you think while we talk about all the local jobs and other things do you think it's a temporary phenomenon or and people will come back uh, once uh, everything is gone might be in 6 months 12 months and life will be back to as it was uh, in january february i think that's a million dollar question i mean and, and very difficult to predict um but my sense is i think um, uh, i mean especially a lot of people in the informal economy i mean the migrant laborers especially after the um you know poor experience that they've had um from employers and from the government in most places right i i think they are going to be more careful and they're going to um even if they venture out for example they will venture out to places or cities that are closer to their um you know villages or um or financial centers which are uh, i mean or district financial centers essentially maybe not national financial centers right so what i mean by that is if people in odisha are looking to venture out you know um in between their cycles of harvest right they will venture out to bhubaneswar right or people in um jharkhand will venture out to ranchi at the max and i think they will be more wary of venturing out for longer distances um because i think we've all seen that um you know it's much more difficult to get back from um you know some of, from places that are far far away compared to some of the places that are near 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 their homes so i think that's that's one trend when it comes to um you know informal sector workers and when it comes to the formal sector workers i think um um i mean the formal sector i believe is not going to be impacted as much um uh, you know when it comes to uh you know this physical restriction in fact it's going to promote um decentralization of offices and you know decentralization of workplaces um and we may even see may even see you know a more and more 
um, corporate setting up their smaller setting of smaller offices maybe um, in you know um, tier two and three cities. So I, I mean that's, yeah, that's I think, my I think, I think uh, that makes absolute sense because people might get used to working from home. Yeah. Uh, one one last question that I would like to take uh, uh, with Ritu. Uh, Ritu, uh, you being a, a, a leader in the women entrepreneurship, uh, doing a lot of things around that. Uh, how do you see the impact on the women workers? Right? Is there something that we should do from a, a reskilling of uh, 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 reskilling them in terms of uh, new needs, or do you see a, a pay scale which is uh, different from a uh, just because of a different gender, the pay scale is different. So do you see any specific problems that we need to address uh, for our uh, women uh, guests uh, in, in, in the uh, blue collar economy? So I think, um, I, I think my response is actually very gender agnostic. I feel that if India focuses on its agenda around industrialization, financialization, urbanization, um, um, uh, human capital, if most of these agendas are, are kept in mind, I think women also would be uh, equal beneficiaries, uh, let's say, or equitable beneficiaries of the benefits of all of this kicking in. Having said that, uh, I do believe, I agree with like what uh, Ankit and Madhav touched upon, the fact that suddenly this uh, digital tsunami has opened up options for people to be able to work from anywhere, which means we have become presenceless. Uh, and for women, of course, that has been always a constraint, right? Because of commuting or responsibilities that they carry, dual responsibility, whatever, it does open up more options. Uh, but I guess in our discussion, we have to be careful that the work from home option is limited to not more than 10, 12% of the workforce in this country. No matter how much we talk about work from home, 88% uh, or above of our Indian workforce today are in outbound jobs because that's the need, that's the role, that's what they are into. And hence, one interesting observation or comment that I have from yesterday's announcement by the FM was how she's actually opened up women being able to work at factories and manufacturing units without any um, uh, hassle. Uh, Ritu, sorry to, uh, Ritu, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we have to start with the next session. Uh, no uh, problem. Oh. So I would like to uh, thank uh, everybody. I think there are a few very important things that we have learned today. Uh, one is uh, uh, that we definitely need a tech platform which provides access uh, to opportunities, access to opportunities from an individual point of view, as well as employer point of view. Might be there is a huge need of hyper, hyper local jobs or local jobs, and there might be a need for reskilling the people. Uh, what is also very important is that we have to look at from a holistic point of view, how uh, government, entrepreneurs, uh, enterprises come together, uh, find the right opportunity for the people. Uh, while tech platform can only build a matching thing, there has to be a lot of job creations uh, as well for our guest workers. So thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate uh, and hope uh, uh, we could add some value uh, and, and knowledge to the people in the audience. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.